Hi there, and welcome to what is it I call this series? Great Books of China? Yeah, Great Books of China series. So I thought that um, after the technical preliminaries that I sort of got a little bit bogged down in last time, that I should this time finally get to discussing this author that I introduced briefly last time, Han Yu, who lived in the Tang Dynasty around 800. And um, maybe I thought I should actually start off by sacrificing a few minutes to giving you the background on the historical circumstances of this figure that we're talking about. So I said the guy lived in the Tang Dynasty, which is the period in Chinese history from around 600 to 900 AD. And if you're a Chinese person, this period probably represents like everything that the cultural peak of Chinese civilization should be. Uh, I would say that this is something of an oversimplification of matters. Um, but this period is uh, surrounded by this uh, myth of cultural glory for uh, various reasons. Most of them are more contemporary than historical or properly historical, I would say. Anyway, when people think of the glory of the Tang Dynasty, it's the first half of the dynasty that they talk about, especially its culmination during the long, 40-year-long reign of the Emperor Xuanzong, which ended with all this power and glory coming crashing down with the outbreak of the absolutely catastrophic Anlushan Rebellion, which broke out in... 755. So the Tang Dynasty was founded in 618 AD and uh, that was then that was the first time in over four centuries that all of the Chinese cultural sphere was integrated under one central imperial authority for uh, a, a period longer than a few decades. So the Tang Dynasty consolidated its power over all of China and then it expanded its territory through diplomacy and through wars during the first part of the 7th century. And it, it turned into the most powerful empire yet in all of East Asian history. And during this period, there was a sort of general surgency, you might say, in many areas of culture and especially in the arts. Uh, so Tang China is especially remembered for its poetry. Uh, Many, if not the most, of the greatest names of uh, Chinese poetry flourished during this period. So in the minds of the Chinese today, all of this power and cultural splendor is sort of blurred together into one great image of imperial power and cultural flourishing. Um, even though the period as a whole also witnessed these extraordinary catastrophes. So what happened in 755 was that the emperor, um, or the empire, I should say, had come to rely a lot on regional military governors called Jiedushi for administrating the whole empire. And this arrangement weakened the central control of the capital. And this whole situation was finally brought past the breaking point by one of these governors called An Lu Shan, who was actually of Turkish origin. So the whole area to the north of the Chinese Empire at that time was mostly inhabited by different uh, Turkish tribes. And many of the territories that uh, were brought under Chinese imperial control during the Tang Dynasty were also mainly uh, various Turkish kingdoms. And there was actually a large ethnically Turkish element to the whole administration of the Tang Dynasty as well, which is why the, the Tang Dynasty is remembered to this day as having been one of the most multicultural of all the Chinese dynasties ever, certainly up until that period. So uh, An Lushan procla proclaimed himself emperor over the territories under his control, which was in the northeastern part of the empire. And this immediately set the whole country on fire. Some of the other regional military governors chose to side with An Lushan. Some of them sided with the uh, the central authority with imperial forces, uh, 
and the whole situation wasn't brought under control again until eight years later. And by then the empire had lost many of its western territories um, and it experienced a population loss of millions of people. It's very hard to establish that sort of thing with pre-modern empires, of course. Um, but there are quite reliable censuses for the period before the outbreak of the rebellion, which point to around 55 million inhabitants for the whole empire, which was reduced to about a third of that after the rebellion. And that means partly that many territories were lost from imperial control, of course. And it also means that there were many displaced persons and a lot of destroyed infrastructure, which meant that they couldn't, they weren't able to register uh, many of the people that were still alive. But it also clearly indicates a massive loss of life. Certainly there were millions of people that died in this conflict. And when, when it all was over in 763, the Tang Dynasty never really regained its former glory. So the war didn't destroy the empire. It still continued in a functioning state, but it continued to be plagued by regional conflict and sometimes quite major uprisings as well, um, which were also complicated by other regional powers interfering, for example, the Tibetan Empire. And our author then, Han Yu, he was born in 768, uh, and the war ended in 763. So when we're talking about his life, we're dealing with this post-war period, you, you could say, when the dynasty was already past its prime. And there is this really palpable sense uh, when reading Han Yu of you know, living in the ruins of a great house uh, in the wake of great destruction, cultural decline. And... Um, about his life, you know, he he was, as most educated men of the day, he was employed at various posts in the imperial administration, but he's not recognized for doing anything important or memorable uh, of a political nature. Uh, but, you know, working for the imperial administration at that time meant that you had to accept posts in various different parts of the empire, and uh, Han Yu, he actually spent some years of his life as an administrator in the very southernmost parts of the country, uh, which back then was really a backwater. It was not a place distinguished by any great local culture of any sophistication. So those were not attractive positions. And uh, Han Yu was forced to accept them on two different occasions, uh, which were both the consequence of him speaking truth to power. So I, I thought I should uh, tell you a little bit, little bit about those occasions right now. So the first occasion was in 803, during a drought in the capital area around Chang'an. Uh, this drought led to a famine in the whole area, with a lot of, lot of people dead. And uh, Han Yu's position then was that he thought that the grain tax should be cancelled for that year, so that people would have a chance of survival. But the situation was downplayed in reports to the emperor, which meant that the taxes on grain stayed the same during this period. And Han Yu was then employed at a position in the government censorate, which was a position that was supposed to gather complaints from the people, review the handling of prisoners, and also to impeach any official for misconduct. And uh, now the story in this situation was that the, uh, the central government under Emperor De Zong actually ordered uh, grain uh, to be lent to the farmers in the area originally, together with, with the removal of the grain taxes for that year, just as Han Yu thought they should be, which is it's also, you know, it's the, it's the reasonable and humane policy in a situation like that, of course. But the governor of the capital, Li Shi, who was also the minister of, of uh, national granaries, he wrote a memorial to the emperor where he said that uh, despite the drought this year, crops are abundant, and therefore taxes and quotas should be kept in place. And uh, in response to this, Han Yu, together with two colleagues of the censorate, wrote an official letter to the emperor pointing out the error of this, and uh, he used the oblique formulation that the situation seems to have passed unmentioned by your majesty's officials. And in this letter, they would also... Uh, they also advised the emperor to instruct the governor to relent from collecting the coin for this year uh, 
together with those stalks and specks already out of reach for taxation within the stomachs of the commoners. Nice formulation. So this was not appreciated by the responsible minister, of course, and uh, he managed to get all of the letters senders demoted to various very distant positions. So Han Yu had to take up the position as magistrate of Yangshan district, which is in the modern province of Guangdong, which, as I said, was a really undeveloped place back then. No Canton Fair back then. And he remained there until uh, more than a year later. And then he got an imperial pardon and went up to take up a, a military position again instead. And uh, the other time that Han Yu got into trouble was in uh, 819, which is really the more famous uh, of the two incidents because it ties so perfectly well in with the larger philosophical and ideological questions that uh, Han Yu was obsessed with throughout his life. And this is the incident of the so-called Buddha Bone Memorial. And I think this also needs some background in order to be properly understood. So as I have said, the ruling Tang Dynasty uh, was in some ways a very multicultural empire. And it had large territories that were populated by non-Chinese people and many Turks and others that were occupying higher ranking positions in the administration and especially in the military. But, um, oh, by the way, if you are uh, somewhat perplexed by me referring to the Turks all the time, you should know that the original Turkish homeland uh, actually is in Central Asia rather than uh, the country that is now called Turkey. So the Uyghur ethnic group, which is dominant in the modern region of Xinjiang in uh, Western China, they are actually Turks pure and simple. And Turkish peoples didn't penetrate as far west as the Anatolian Peninsula, uh, modern Turkey, I mean, until the 11th century. Uh, many of you probably know that, but just, that's just for those of you who don't. Uh, anyway, so being a multicultural empire, uh, the Tang Dynasty was also open to various foreign religious influences. And the most important of these uh, was Buddhism. And by the 9th century, which is the period that we're talking about, Buddhism had already had a very long history in China. Uh, it had been introduced into China already during the Han Dynasty, uh, around the time of the Christ. And then it spread gradually and gained a more influence during the centuries from the collapse of the old Han Empire around 200 AD uh, up until the beginnings of the Tang around 600. So... Um, well, the history of Buddhism in China is actually really interesting, and I'm, I'll probably return to that subject uh, more at one point or another, but here it's just, uh, it's just necessary to get the basics down. You know, you know probably that Buddhism is um, an originally Indian religion uh, that developed from the Indo-European Vedic tradition, and uh, several of the neighboring countries around China today are still Buddhist. For example, the Mongols, the Tibetans, the Burmese, and so on. So Buddhism was brought into China by foreigners and all the various dynasties that uh, were established in the north of China during the period be, uh, between the Han and Tang empires by these various uh, non-Chinese peoples probably had a lot to do with Buddhism gaining a foothold in the area. But actually that period between uh, Han and Tang is not one that I'm all that familiar with so far. But I think it's fair to say that Buddhism really became the most important intellectual and philosophical movement in China already by the 4th century or so. So that means that when we reach the Tang dynasty, Buddhism is already a very well established part of Chinese culture. And there were already several indigenous schools of Buddhism in China when Han Yu was alive. And the really major character of Buddhism in China during the Tang is the famous monk uh, Xuanzang, who was a traveler and a translator and a philosopher who went to India in the very beginning of the Tang era. And he returned back to the capital with hundreds of original manuscripts of Buddhist texts, which he established a translation bureau in the imperial capital of Chang'an in order to translate with uh, the support of the imperial court. And when we get to Han Yu, our author, which is like 150 years later or, or a little bit more than that, Chinese Buddhism 
had already begun to morph into what is now called Zen Buddhism or Chan Buddhism in Chinese. Zen is actually the Japanese pronunciation of the same word, Chan in Chinese. Uh, and at this time, Buddhism enjoyed a very large government support. Uh, Buddhism was very revered by the emperors, but Han Yu, who, as we will see, is the most radical classicist you can imagine, he thinks it's merely a deplorable foreign sect and a part and parcel of the ongoing moral and uh, cultural collapse. So the situation, the actual uh, situation had to do with a certain tradition connected to a Buddhist relic. Uh, a relic, as you might know, is a body part or some other object from a holy person. And uh, the practice of worshipping relics of saints, that's something that you can find here and there around the world. If you go to Italy, for example, uh, you can find a lot of medieval and renaissance reliquaries in their museums. And it's usually a piece of bone. It might be a finger bone or a, a, a piece of a skull or something else. And it's kept in a case that certain, it's sometimes it's very artfully and uh, made and decorated and everything. So in China at the time, there was this finger bone that was supposed to have belonged to the original historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha. And this relic was kept in a temple in the city of Fengxiang, to the west of the capital. And the tradition was that it was only brought out to be seen by the public once every 30 years. So it was quite an, quite an occasion when that happened. So this was supposed to happen then in 819. And the emperor at the time, Xianzong, who was one of the really great emperors of the later Tang Dynasty, he arranged to have the relic picked up as it was traveling from Fengxiang to the central capital in Chang'an. And then the relic was kept picked up. And then it was kept in the imperial palace for three days until it was returned to the temple. And for Han Yu, um, the fact that the Chinese emperor participated in this ritual and even granted this relic entrance into the imperial palace was basically equivalent to blasphemy as far as he was concerned. Buddhism is merely a barbaric sect, he states in the opening words to this memorial that I mentioned. It's kind of funny, actually, when you read... When you read Han Yu's works, you become aware of his negative attitude to both Buddhism and Taoism quite quickly. There are, uh, there are even a couple of letters to Buddhists and Taoists in his surviving works. And in these letters, he devotes, he, he devotes these letters to basically discrediting their religious beliefs, albeit in a rather polite and circumspect manner even though he sometimes uh, resorts to near name calling. There is one example where he implies that the recipient of a letter is, quote, a remarkable but confused character. So the confusion there, of course, pertains to his religious beliefs, the Buddhism in question. Or is it a Taoist? I think that's a Taoist, actually. But even, even when reading those letters, that doesn't really tell you that he has the audacity for the stuff that you find in the letter to the emperor about the Buddha bone. So I will quote here the end of the letter, uh, which contains Han Yu's recommendations to Emperor Xianzong. I find it truly disgraceful that your majesty would needlessly approach this rotten and filthy thing in person, without the traditional precautions of priests, rushes and peach, without one word of criticism from your officials, and without one reminder of the error of such ways from your censors. I beg that this bone instead may be handed over to the authorities and then committed to water or fire so as to forever destroy the root of this universal confusion for the sake of coming generations, thereby letting the world see how much the actions of superior wisdom differ from those of the common swarm. No mincing of words there. So this letter almost cost, cost um, Han Yu his life. Uh, so he was only spared from execution because other people at court stepped in and talked the emperor out of it. And actually, the, the part I just quoted wasn't the part that incensed the emperor the most. Instead, it was the first part of the letter where he some, somewhat tediously reports on all the long reigns and lifetimes of mythical emperors and then contrasts these like Emperor Shun reigned for 90 years and became 
150 years old, something like that. It's, it's quite like in Genesis, this kind of Adam was 900 years old and had many sons and daughters. Yeah, and then he contrasts this with the short reigns and general chaos of the so-called Buddhist centuries between the Han and Tang dynasties. So that is to say, the emperor, Xian Zong, thought that Han Yu was implying that the emperor would die young and have a short reign, and this was inexcusable. But anyway, his life was spared, eventually, but he was demoted to the prefect of Chaozhou, which again was in the absolute southern part of the empire, uh, in modern Guangdong, that's a huge city today. Uh, when he arrived at this new post, he wrote a new letter to the emperor, and this time it was in the form of a formal apology. But this letter is really hilarious, actually. He starts by expressing his thankfulness for the magnanimous treatment by the emperor, you know, normal enough. But then he immediately goes off into describing how terrible this area is, you know, how unsuited it is for a man of his age and capabilities. And, you know, actually, Han Yu is, he's over 50 years old now. So that could be considered fairly old back then. But as, as if that wasn't enough, he starts boasting about his capabilities as a writer. And this is really quotable stuff, so I will read some of this to you. He says, When it comes to modern writing, I am no better than anybody else. But for relating your majesty's deeds and powers, I will be a match for the letters and poems. In crafting hymn and verse to your ancestral altars, fit for rites of Mount Tai, carved on tablets of jade, magnifying such greatness as to rival heaven, telling deeds of unprecedented glory, works such as to enter our scriptures without shame and stand before all the universe without diminishment. In that, I would not be willing to retreat much, though all the ancients were alive here before me. What do you think about that? Um... Me, I mean, I just love this kind of grandiose declarations. It's not very common that writers actually do this, even in private writings, let alone in official correspondence. But when, um, when a writer who knows that he's good actually has the guts to openly say so, that I just get this warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart. That's so. When I read this for the first time, actually, the, I immediately started thinking about Dante. There's this passage in the beginning of Paradise, you know, the Italian poet, so Inferno, Purgatory, Paradise. In the beginning of Paradise, he, he also boasts uh, like this, of his extraordinary poetic powers. So he, before he starts describing his journey through the heavenly spheres, he uses the metaphor of, of himself as a large ship that's setting sail on a sea that nobody has traveled before. It's magnificent. So this is, this is we can say, it's a privilege that must be granted to supreme genius. Nothing else is, is reasonable, but I mean, writing that in a letter to the emperor and, you know, expect that you would be, like, pardoned, it's, it's strange, to say the least. Well, anyway, then, he's, then he closes this letter with, with a recommendation that the emperor should go and perform the grand sacrifice at Mount Tai. And this was traditionally the most sacred of all imperial ceremonies. And actually, this recommendation has been viewed by later writers as being extremely presumptuous. This was a, a ceremony that was so sacred that it was not something that a mere subject was supposed to have private opinions on. At least he should not try to influence the emperor into performing it. So he was doing a, breaking some taboos here in this apology for the first uh, taboo breaking again. Well, and to be fair, um, the only point uh, for Han Yu of doing this, recommending that the emperor go and perform this sacrifice, was probably just to recommend himself as a writer of sacrificial texts for the occasion. But uh, I guess we could suppose that the emperor didn't really care enough about Han Yu at this point, and there was nowhere f further away for Han Yu to be demoted, so this rather scandalous letter didn't cause him any more troubles either. And this time, Han Yu, he didn't have to remain at this post for too long either. He was called back to the capital after the death of Emperor Xianzong, which was the year after that, so that's 820. And um, I thought that just to close off this uh, episode, that uh, I should mention that there's another aspect to this story as well. There's a tragic aspect to this story, 
since uh, Han Yu actually lost one of his daughters because of this as well. So there's this sacrificial text and a burial description in his collected works that tell us of this episode. And I thought I should end now by reading a longer quote from this sacrificial text. So this, was his, this is the sacrificial text for his daughter who died 12 years old. And uh, this text is originally, originally it's written in a kind of rhythmic prose or prose verse. I don't know what you might say. It, it's, a, it's a form that was rather common for this type of texts. So in the original, each line has four syllables, which you'll see in the text that I'll put in the video here. But, but I've translated it into regular prose because this kind of style isn't really possible to convey into English anyway. So, so he says... <clears throat> My banishment to the south came when your illness was at its peak, and our hurried parting caused you much trouble and distress. As I watched your face then, I could sense the nearness of death, and in the glance you returned there was a sadness already beyond tears. After my departure south, the sentence fell for the rest of the family, and then you were conveyed to a carriage to travel from dawn until dusk. Snow and cold shattered your weakened frame. The ardors of the road gave no time for rest, and lack of food and drink caused you hunger and thirst. Such a death in remote mountains was not your destiny. When young ones succumb to the elements, it is the parents who must be blamed. I was surely the one who brought you to this. Then you were given a grassy grave by the side of the road, with no coffin for a coffin, and after your burial we passed on, with nobody left to guard or watch over you, no one at all for your little soul and your frozen bones to cling to. Yes, everyone dies, but your death was an injustice. Coming back from the south, I approached you again in tears, your glance and your face still haunting my eye, your heart and your manner so slow to fade from my memory. And on that somber tone, I think we should end this episode before it becomes too long.